Welcome. This panel is a is a very directly a follow-on to the plenary uh, discussion that you just that you just heard. I was sitting there for part of it and thinking, okay, we'll just press replay. And <laughs> we can have that in in our panel. Um, we're here to talk about constitutionalism for the 21st century, and in particular, a constitutionalism that stands for real economic opportunity, advances a new politics of equality that would. Um, <coughs> that would go to some of the issues that you heard the speakers talk about the, at the plenary, issues of, of health care, education, um, meaningful work, uh, housing, and the like. Um, and also on the panel to provide uh, not only support but critique of such a project. Um, I've been asked to remind you to turn off cell phones and other spontaneous noisemakers because the session is uh, being taped. Um, so we basically are going to have, uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, each of them is going to have a chance to make some just very brief opening remarks. Um, then we're going to have some discussion among the panelists and then open it to, to questions uh, from you. So the first person who's going to speak is Alan Jenkins to my immediate left. He's the executive director of a nonprofit organization that he founded, the Opportunity Agenda. Um, and before that, he was the Director of Human Rights at the Ford Foundation. He was an assistant to the Solicitor General at the Department of Justice, where he argued Supreme Court cases. And he was Associate Counsel to the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where he defended the rights of low-income communities. He was a law clerk to um, Justice Blackman and a law clerk to uh, Judge Robert Carter. Um, and he and I have also been co-chairs of the ACS uh, um, Equality and Liberty, not, you're a co-chair, I'm sorry, of the, of the um, uh, Constitution of the 21st Century, and we've been, we've been co-participants on the Equality and Liberty Working Group, um, and he went to Harvard Law School and Harvard College. Um, and then to Alan's immediate left is Lynn Walker Huntley. Um, she's the president of the Southern Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization based in Atlanta that promotes equity and excellence in education in the American South. And she's also, she has an extensive background in, in human rights and comparative uh, human rights and, and did a major project on Brazil, South Africa, and, uh, and the United States. And she is a daughter of Fisk University and Barnard College and did her law degree at Columbia where she was the first African American woman on um, the law journal, the law review there. Uh, she's been the director of the Rights and Social Justice Program at the Ford Foundation. She was a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division in the Justice Department, and she, too, was a lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, and last but not least is Michael Grieva, who is the John G. Searle Scholar and Director of the Federalism Project at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, so he's the good sport on the, on the panel. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, he's also a member of the Board of Directors of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and his research interests include federalism, constitutional law, environmental policy, internet regulation. Um, he's also been a classroom professor at uh, Boston College and at his alma mater, Cornell, where he got his master's and his PhD, uh, I believe, in government. And he's a native of Germany and did his undergraduate work in Hamburg, uh, West Germany. Um, he was one of the founders and was for, I think, 11 years director of the Center for Individual Rights, which is a public interest law firm here in Washington, D.C., that's worked on a lot of precedent-setting uh, cases, including United States versus Morrison, which was the case that invalidated in part the Violence Against Women Act on federalism grounds, and Rosenberger versus Rectors of the University of Virginia, which established that student religious publications have First Amendment rights to funding on equal terms with uh, non-religious student publications. Um, so Michael and I have in common that we both sued Virginia about their higher ed because I worked on the, the VMI case. Um, and we also have in common that we both did sex discrimination federalism cases because I was lead counsel in Nevada versus Hibbs, albeit on the other side. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just give you a little bit of background about the panel. <clears throat> um, at the end of World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt made a major national effort uh, to draw a link between um, domestic security, economic security within the United States, 
and international security, sort of what we more typically think of as security, military security. Um, and he, kind of the, the crystallizing achievement of that was uh, his famous State of the Union Address, January 11th, 1944, in which he announced what he termed the Second Bill of Rights, which was framed, you know, very much in as a Bill of Rights, a series of rights like the first Bill of Rights that's in the Constitution. And this Second Bill of Rights included guarantees of work, of adequate housing and income, of medical care and education, among other guarantees. Um, and these were uh, promises that were designed to sort of extend and develop uh, the New Deal programs, and also very frankly designed to help counter the attractions of communism. Um, so uh, many, and, and I, you know, many of the great legislative achievements of the past uh, 60 years, 70 years, stem from Roosevelt's Second Bill of Rights. We have, uh, in part as a result of his legacy, the wildly popular programs like uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and public education, public education dating from before then, but the support for that is really um, grounded in and leavened by the Second Bill of Rights. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of discussion in the plenary about ju judicial and jurocentric visions of the Constitution and extrajudicial or more um, broad-based ideas of constitutionalism is very much a theme for FDR and his second Bill of Rights. Now, originally for this panel, Cass Sunstein was scheduled to be here and be kind of a, an anchor to it. Uh, in 2004, uh, Cass Sunstein published this book, The Second Bill of Rights, FDR's Unfinished Revolution and Why We Need It More Than Ever, um, which is a whole book about this speech and about this theme. Um, and he was, una he's unable to be here. So he has, uh, uh, one of the things that ACS did in order to sort of uh, compensate and respond to that was, um, we're gonna have a blog post set up uh, after this session, which is gonna uh, summarize a little bit of the themes from today and give, if he chooses, give Sunstein a chance to, to log in on some of the stuff uh, that we're gonna talk about um, today. Um, Okay, so, so we have a tradition in the United States of social and economic rights, but it's not very well understood, and its connection to the Constitution is not uh, very well understood. And part of this panel is to sort of give you a chance to hear from people who are engaged in um, supportive and critical analysis of this tradition uh, to, to invite ACL, ACS members to do more to study and build on, on this project. Um, and I have to say, I think the message of uh, FDR and of the Second Bill of Rights seems even more timely now than when Sunstein wrote his book in, in 2004. Um, we have vast majorities of Americans who are dissatisfied with economic conditions in the United States. We see a housing crisis, a clamor uh, for universal health care, hunger for better education, uh, dissatisfaction with the No Child Left Behind framework. Uh, sense of really acute need to position our workers to do more to compete uh, in a global economy. Um, and we're also, I think, in a period of building momentum for some basic changes uh, in the coming years. Um, these are exciting times. Um, my substantive part of the panel is just very briefly to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the um, foreign and comparative uh, bases for this. But I think I am not going to do that right now, but I'm going to get right to my panelists and interject those other, um, that other content when it is appropriate. So I'd like to turn to Alan and, and give him a chance to talk about, about his work. Great. Thanks very much, Nina. And good afternoon. We're going to try again. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right. I just want to make sure you're out there. Uh, I want to start uh, actually with an apology because I'm going to begin by reading briefly from a cluster of legal and political texts. And I won't be one of those panelists who reads his presentation uh, for my full seven minutes, but I think it's important in this case to, to begin with some of the language that's relevant. So first, one sentence from each of three different legal texts uh, from three different decades all relating to economic rights and particularly the, the right to health. So first. 
Uh, the protection and promotion of the health of the inhabitants of the state are members of public, uh, pardon me, matters of public concern, and provision therefore shall be made by the state and by such of its subdivisions, and by such means as the legislature shall from time to time determine. That's from Article 17 of the New York State Constitution, which was adopted at the Constitutional Convention of 1938 uh, in the depths of the Depression. Uh, second, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health, uh, the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, and old age. And so that, some of you will recognize, is from Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the U.S. helped to craft and to promote, to promote uh, in 1948, uh, led by Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the head of the U.S. De uh, delegation. Uh, and third, uh, the General Assembly finds that equal enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is a human right and a priority of the state. And that's from the Health Equity Commissions Act passed by the Connecticut legislature signed this week by the governor of Connecticut. Uh, this was uh, June of 2008. Uh, if you'll indulge me, just two more quotes, uh, this time from two different U.S. presidents separated by more than half a century. And the first you'll, many of you will recognize, we've come to a clear realization of the fact that uh, true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. In our day, these economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. We have accepted, so to speak, a second Bill of Rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race, or creed. Among these are the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. And that, of course, is from the Economic Bill of Rights, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's 1944 uh, State of the Union Address. Finally, uh, the mission of the United Nations requires liberating people from hunger and disease. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration states, Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food and clothing and housing and medical care. Around the world, the United Nations is carrying out noble efforts to live up to these words. And that's from President George W. Bush's 2000 speech to the UN General Assembly. Uh, and so what to make of all this? And uh, perhaps just as important, what do Americans think? What does our country think about this notion of economic rights? And so uh, my organization, the Opportunity Agenda, wanted to explore that question. And so we uh, commissioned a major national poll and a set of focus groups on Americans, the American public's views about human rights in the United States. And it produced some results that at least uh, to me, as somebody who has uh, kind of lived both in the domestic uh, civil rights world and in the international human rights world, were surprising. Uh, so we found, for example, that 89% of Americans believe that access to health care should be considered a human right. 72% of Americans agreed strongly with that proposition. 77% believe that, quote, our government has a responsibility to guarantee access to health care for all of us, with 58% agreeing strongly. Uh, Two-thirds agreed that upholding human rights may mean expanding government assistance uh, programs for things such as housing, food, health care, and jobs. Only a third rejected that idea. But, uh, and you begin to see the complexity of Americans' views, seven in ten Americans express concern that poor people in the United States have become too dependent on government assistance programs. Uh, and Americans are much more comfortable with government as protector of rights than as provider of rights. And that applies even to education, which all would acknowledge uh, the government provides to the vast majority of Americans. So taken together, what do these speeches, these uh, American values and attitudes, uh, these provisions say about mm -hmm. the notion of economic rights, and in particular, uh, the right to health in the United States? I think a, a number of things. First, that economic rights, including the opportunity to enjoy good health, have deep roots in the American consciousness and in American law, uh, whether they emanate from the inalienable right uh, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or from the trauma of the Great Depression and how it changed our country along with World War II. Uh, they are one, economic rights are one part of us. They're one part of our law and of our uh, public consciousness. But they're only one part, and at the same time, 
our history, our electorate, uh, our jurisprudence are profoundly ambivalent, even schizophrenic, uh, some might say, about what place those rights should occupy in a modern era. And sitting on the other side of the mirrored glass in the focus groups, uh, you would see that. There's a famous uh, quote, for, it may be apocryphal, but a quote from uh, a focus group on, on health in which uh, a focus group participant shouted out, keep government's hands off my Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Uh, but it, it reflects the ambivalence that Americans carry about government, about personal responsibility, about uh, economic rights, but also uh, their limitations. Uh, third is that where these rights are, are acknowledged, they can be, they frequently are, justiciable. Uh, one of the objections to the notion of economic rights in general, and particularly the right to health, is that you know, they're aspirational at best. Uh, that they can't be enforced by any court. Uh, and uh, presidential administrations since the Cold War, so in other words, not only uh, uh, including the current uh, presidential administration, but, in, uh, but also including the Clinton and Carter and Reagan and uh, Bush 41 White Houses and, and before, have uh, generally denied that such rights, economic rights, even exist, which is one of the reasons why it was so astounding to hear President Bush, the current President Bush, talk about Article 25, uh, which uh, administrations, including his, have denied are in fact human rights. Uh, but this notion of justiciability is, uh, a, the, the challenge is, is really uh, answered by uh, our experience in many state courts around the country in the context of education and in health in New, in the New York State. Uh, we see the same. So a 1994 New York case called Hope versus Perales. Uh, for example, plaintiffs claim that because the uh, New York prenatal care assistance program excluded abortion from its medical services, it violate, violated New York State's uh, public health provision. Uh, the, the New York State's high court disagreed, it rejected that claim, but on the merits. In other words, it considered the claim, uh, there was no question of its uh, justiciability uh, in the state courts of New York, uh, and it, uh, ultimately the court decided that uh, low-income women had access to the full range of, of services, and so the right was de not denied. Uh, many of you are also familiar with uh, the right to health cases in uh, South Africa uh, on, on uh, the obligation of the government to provide antiretroviral drugs to pregnant, low-income, HIV-positive women, for example, uh, and where the court has required the government to provide a plan for the provision uh, of services. And so this raises a, an important uh, notion that, the, first of all, that the right to health is not the right to be healthy or to live a long and healthy life, which of course would not be just justiciable or even achievable. Uh, it's it's the, the right of equal opportunity to, uh, the, the, to have the highest standard, the highest attainable standard of health in your society, uh, and to have public systems that help to make that happen. Uh, and it includes in the international context the notion of, of progressive realization, the idea that conditions on the ground, and particularly financial conditions, are important to the realization of economic rights, that there is a difference between a government that is unable to protect the health of its society uh, and a government that is unwilling to do so, and that those are, are legally uh, different as well as, as in practice. Um, I don't have to tell you that the right to health and to health care is uh, largely unfulfilled in all, almost all of the places where we see it. Uh, so the, the 47 million uninsured Americans, uh, the 18,000 who, according to the National Institute of Health, die every year because they don't have health insurance, uh, the many, many people of color uh, and uh, non-English speakers who are facing steep barriers to quality care uh, and to access, uh, th these are all, I think, a failure to achieve uh, the, the right to health. Uh, and yet, finally, we have an important opportunity right now uh, to begin to fulfill those rights. Uh, and that's one of the things that I hope we'll all talk about in, in the, the rest of today's session. Uh, in New York State, uh, certainly the, the public health provision of the Constitution is ripe for litigation in the right context with the right kind of case uh, and uh, presented in the right way, but I think it's very important. I think in terms of, of unequal access and quality uh, of health care, uh, the Supreme Court decision in Sandoval has taken away as a, as a private federal cause of action uh, the uh, HHS regulations under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 64, which provide uh, really a pretty comprehensive regime of, of equal access and quality. However, in a new administration, uh, we know that uh, the Office for Civil Rights at HHS receives 
complaints. Many of us probably in the room have filed uh, such complaints in the past. Uh, and we can push Congress to overturn Sandoval through legislation. And then finally, there's good old-fashioned advocacy and organizing. Uh, our opinion research shows that the American people are very much ready uh, for the notion of economic rights and the right to health. Uh, but again, it has to be an American form. Uh, it has to acknowledge people's concerns about personal responsibility, uh, about expense, and about the role of government. It needs to build on uh, where they are now and create a system uh, that serves people's actual needs and, and uh, hopes and desires and values. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. and Thank you very much. Great. Lynn, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Good afternoon, faithful few. I know you've had the force feeding of the brain, and I hope that I can add a little bit more to the uh, overflow. Uh, I come from Atlanta, and we work on education issues in the American South, where 40 percent of all of the poor people in the United States reside, where a majority of the African American population lives, and where a rapidly expanding third of the Latino population uh, is uh, in, in residence. So we come from a part of the country which has deep, concentrated poverty that has been entrenched almost since the end of the Civil War, small pockets of economic progress fueled by in-migration of talented people notwithstanding. Uh, in 2003, uh, the Honorable Jesse Jackson, member of Congress, introduced before uh, the House of Representatives Resolution 29, which provided in pertinent part, Section 1, all citizens of the United States shall enjoy the right to a public education of equal high quality. Section 2, the Congress shall have the power to implement this article by appropriate legislation. The bill died, but the idea did not, and it's to that uh, point that I wish to talk with you briefly today. Let me start by clearing up two broad misconceptions about uh, education. The first that I hear all the time is, we're spending a fortune in education and nothing ever changes and the problems are just insoluble. But in fact, our nation, compared to other developed nations around the world, spends less on public education. Uh, indeed, it's about 5% of our gross domestic product. So I ask you, given the importance of education, think about yourselves. You wouldn't be in this room if you had not been the beneficiary of a quality education. How important is education, and how much of our combined resources should we be spending on it? The second misconception I wish to, to uh, point out is we talk about public education failing. But there is no public education system in the United States. There are 15,000 school districts in 50 states that together comprise our systems of public education. These states and school districts provide, as we all know, most of the funding for public education. The federal government only provides about 7% of the aggregate amount spent on public education. So the inquiry in which the Southern Education Foundation has been involved since 2003 is to examine, given the tremendous problems in public education, most salient in the South, what might be wrought were there some form of education amendment to the United States Constitution? As we have gone around the country, commissioned research, done our homework, I've had a lot of objections voiced to the very idea of an education amendment. Some have objected on the grounds that this would open up the floodgates to retrogressive causes and frivolous mm -hmm. things that could be very dangerous. Some have said that the effort is a diversion from what we can really achieve. It's such a long-term, long-haul effort. It's hardly worth it. We ought to be focused on the here and now. Some have said that the federal government is unable to do anything right. Why in the world would we want to give them more authority in the field of education? And some have simply asserted that if you were to have some form of federal education amendment, the cure would be worse than the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I take all of these concerns very seriously. Uh, as a lawyer, albeit a lapsed lawyer, um, I understand how important it is to have a strong constitution and what is at stake. 
But I point out to all of us that this is increasingly a very diverse nation we have. And public education, quality public education, plays an important role in shaping national values, core identity, and harmonizing differences between and among groups. And I think that's very important. And so I don't just shy away reflexively from the idea of doing something about education at the federal level. Likewise, at a time when we all know how important education is to economic competitiveness in the global environment, when we all understand the importance of education uh, as a spur to economic development and improved quality of life and the engine of our uh, economy, as we all think about the importance of education in civic participation and informed political participation, I find myself asking the question, why shouldn't the United States Constitution acknowledge the fundamental national interest in education in some way? Don't we want as a nation to have a permanent touchstone for national priority setting that assures that education investment in the talents and capacities of our people is treated as a first order social good deserving of adequate resources and attention by all people? Don't we want that? Second, I keep remembering, perhaps it's my location in the nation, the pernicious history of states' rights in a variety of areas, not the least of which is education. Left to their own devices, there is a sad history of state governments and local governments failing to protect and provide quality education for vulnerable or groups perceived to be different. Moreover, um, I don't see any evidence that local and state governments can or will make the investments in education of low-income people that the national interest demands. As I want to say to colleagues, state legislators, local people have three options if they're in political office. They can reallocate money for rich to poor. They don't want to do that. They can raise taxes. They don't want to do that. So what do they do? They invariably say you can fix the problem without resources. Well, one of the reasons why the South has such inadequate education and one of the reasons why there's such poor quality education in a variety of low-income school districts is because of the way we finance education. If there are rich and poor school districts, it stands to reason that you're going to have poorly resourced as well as well-resourced schools with the predictable variance in outcomes. I'm the last person since I work in education every day to say that it, money is the sole solution to the problems of education, but on the other hand, uh, it's clear to me, otherwise Harvard would need such a big endowment, that money is often the condition precedent to having quality uh, education. Is my time up? No, I'm just okay. listening. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, it may be. Oh, oh, my time may be up, uh, almost. Um, today, the litigative and judicial framework for assessing education adequacy is largely a function of state constitutions. We're all familiar with the fact that there have been over 40 such local state constitutionally based cases challenging the inadequacy of uh, education in predominantly low income and often rural school districts around the country. But adequacy lawyers would be the first to admit that although there have been some important remedies secured and some gains in improving resource allocation made, by and large, we have a patchwork of uneven answers to uh, education adequacy claims and gross inadequacy still between and among states. So I ask the question, does anyone in this room believe that the quality of any American's education should be dependent upon color or national origin, geography, or class? That's what the proposed education amendment that we are considering could help to address. It could, among other things, provide for the federal government an obligation to adequately finance education so that at least there would be a baseline of quality education accessible to all Americans. I'll conclude with this uh, thought. I know that this is a long-haul effort, 
but I'm also convinced that this is an idea whose time has come. And we may not be ready to make it a reality today, but I don't suspect that anyone in this room would imagine 50 years from now we will find it tolerable to have 50 or 60 percent of kids dropping out of school, having no skills, being the leader in imprisonment of low-income people and the like. I don't believe that. So sooner or later, this nation is going to have to come to terms with the structural inequalities that are resulting in these inadequacies. And when it does, I believe that an education amendment will be the result. Now, one final thing. This need not supplant all kinds of other efforts to move in the right direction. On some level, if you think about it as a pragmatic matter, you have to have someone charting the furthest reach of an idea in order to give space for lesser steps along the way to achieve it. And we've all seen from the experience with ERA the tremendous responses that resulted as a result of what ultimately proved to be a failed education amendment effort. The second thing I would say is that most Americans already believe that they have a right to education, and indeed they do at the state level. They don't understand that they have no federal right to education. I think if we woke people up and they knew that where you live is a very strong predictor of what quality education you are going to receive, and that these children of color who are often pointed to as somehow they're being to blame for poor educational results, when in fact we never report on the inadequate resources that have been put into their education, I think that you would have a hue and cry very supportive of this amendment. I'll conclude with this uh, thought. They say that to those who only have a hammer, the whole world seems to be a nail. Well, I feel that way about education. Almost everything that we want to have in this country, given the complexities of the world and the problems we confront, depend upon having the most well-educated, engaged people we can possibly generate. Equal opportunity means nothing if it is not accompanied by equal ability through education to take advantage of equal opportunity. So that is why uh, we are involved in this enterprise. We will be releasing our report in September, and we welcome a fulsome debate because the whole goal of this is to wake people up and get people thinking about what kind of education do we want to have, what kind of education do we need to have? And if we really are one nation, what kind of education should everyone be entitled to have, irrespective of place? And I thank you. Thank you, Len. Michael. What's the greatest speech of the 20th century? I have a dream. We will fight them on the beaches. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Ask not what, you can, what your country can do for you. No. According to Cass Sunstein, this speech by uh, President Roosevelt in 1944 was the greatest speech of the 20th century. If that wouldn't have occurred to you, I don't blame you, because it wouldn't have occurred to me either. In fact, I think in one single sentence, Professor Sunstein has managed to summarize the entire pathology of modern progressive thought, um, which, is, <laughs> which is an addiction to constituency politics as opposed to constitutional politics. Let me explain what I mean in three points. I'll call the first point security, I'll call the second point entrenchment, and I'll call the third point, transparency. Security. Um, Cass says the point of this, and Nina alluded to this, the point of this speech was security. That's a fundamental human condition and ambition. That's right. He says that resonates and should resonate today. That's also right. He says that's a liberal aspiration, not some socialist conspiracy. Also true. The question is, what do you mean by that and how do you go about ensuring it? The Constitution itself, and I mean the one we actually had or have, um, gives you five kinds of security. Defense against enemies, foreign and domestic. The political stability that comes from having a written Constitution 
the separation of powers, a system of checks and balances. Hard money, you will not drown in a sea of worthless paper. Your contracts will be honored. And you will have the security of being able to move about in this country and do business wherever you see fit. Those are your securities. What did the New Deal do with that? Answer, it preserved the first and wiped out the rest of them. One for five, that ain't bad. What put it in its stead? Answer, the distributional politics under a plebiscitary presidency, under an entrenched political coalition called the New Deal Coalition, and under expert administrative management. My proposition to you is that cannot make you secure. You cannot create security for some constituencies and in some corner of the economy without making anybody else, everybody else less secure. The unfunded liabilities of the United States government currently stand at $80 trillion. To give you a sense of that, if you wiped out the entire American, uh, United States twice and rebuilt it twice, that's about $80 trillion. There are 20 more trillion dollars rattling around in state and local budgets. Where do those trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities come from? Answer, the unfinished revolution. Mr. Uh, Professor Sunstein's and President Roosevelt's constitutional commitments, that's where the liabilities come from. I sincerely hope that the younger people in this audience are committed to the unfinished revolution because whether you get to finish or not, it or not, you will get to pay for it. And the answer or the, the question is, do you want more of the same now more than ever? Now, of course, Professor Kassanstein sees that argument coming. And so he says, well, no, no, I, that's not what I mean. We have to be, with respect to the means, we have to be flexible, we have to be pragmatic, we have to be mindful of resource constraints. So, for example, he opposes the minimum wage to his great credit, at least in this book. Uh, but I think that's a deeply conflicted proposition, and let me tell you why I think that, and that's my entrenchment point. Entrenchment of entitlements is the point of this program. Once you subscribe to that, you can say goodbye to flexibility and you can say the f goodbye to resource constraints. There are two reasons. The first is simple path dependency. As Cass Sunstein remarks, we are already awash in very rigid entitlements that cannot be changed. That's how we know that they are commitments. So how does this program help? The deeper reason has to do with the nature of these rights or entitlements or aspirations or whatever you want to call them, commitments, in the first place. Traditional rights are sort of keep out signs. This is my property. This I own. You keep out. The government, please, keep out. Uh, that can't be right of these, of, of these economic rights. That can't be the case because it's always a claim on somebody else's resources. So what is it actually that you get to own when you get these rights? And I think what you get to own is a piece of the policy-making apparatus. This is oriented towards constituencies and in particular organized constituencies. Look at the second bill that writes itself. It says, it, it goes down the New Deal coalition and says, what do we have to have for each of our constituencies? So, industrial workers, they get their labor unions and a right to work. The farmers, they get the subsidies. We have to put, pick up the petite bourgeoisie someplace, around, someplace along the way so they get the Robinson-Patman Act. Um, we have to pick up the farmers, as I already said. We have to pick up the public sector unions. That's what education does and so on and on. Conversely, what's curiously missing in this entire Bill of Rights? Answer the question that would agitate America for two consecutive generations, namely civil rights. And the reason why that's missing here is he couldn't, it, President Roosevelt couldn't mention it because that would have broken the Democratic coalition in the South because the caste system there was the basis of the Democratic Party in the South. This is from top to bottom oriented towards organized constituencies. And that means this program is going to lock them in and these constituencies aren't given to flexibility and pragmatism. That isn't their job. Their job is to say this is ours and now give us more. And that is not a solution to our political problems. That is our problem. My final point, transparency. Cass says these don't have to be real rights, although they're formulated like that. Uh, they have to be just constitutional commitments. They may be justiciable and enforceable, but they may not be. 
Um, what does that mean? What are we actually talking about here? Well, there are two answers so far as I can tell in the book, um, and they're, they're, they're as follows. The first is, don't worry about it. Make the commitment first. We'll let you know later what it's about. In other words, it reads like an opinion by Justice Kennedy. And the second, and the second answer Cass gives is, and this is an actual paradigm or model that he proposes, and that is South Africa, which Alan mentioned. We, the court, will not tell you what exactly you have to do. We just say you, the legislature, have to come up with a coherent program. A coherent program in the United States of America? Our entire institutional system is designed not to have a coherent program and very nearly to be incapable of it. What if the legislatures don't come up with these programs? The usual answer in the United States is they end up in some district court under the supervision of some special master, um, and the interest groups in that process are among themselves. How would you know whether that system succeeded or failed? Who would you blame when it fails? If you don't mind an international comparison of my own. Um, it's not only us who don't want to be governed like that. Even the Europeans don't want to be governed like that. Europe is awash in social rights and commitments. It has two courts that enforce them. If those aren't enough, it has the national courts. And despite that, every time the Europeans get a chance to vote on this stuff, they say no. Not because they oppose the rights, they like them, but because they have no idea what they're getting into. The Lord God smiles on the Irish, and this weekend he has a reason to be proud of them. Um, picking up on some of the themes that, that I hear from you, one is, um, Lynn, I was interested to hear you championing the constitutional amendment route, in part because, uh, as you mentioned, um, there are many people who would say that not only at the state level, but at the federal level, we already have a constitutional guarantee. And Goodwin Liu, who was on our last panel, has written a, a substantial article on that. And, and Sunstein, as, as Michael said, is a little less clear about this. Uh, Sunstein, in his book, hews sort of a new category that he calls constitutive commitments. He says, you know, I'm not sure that these Second Bill of Rights um, guarantees rise to the level of constitutional rights, at least as they now stand, but, but we can descriptively uh, uh, embrace them as constitutive commitments, sometimes justiciable, as Michael says, sometimes not. Um, but I guess that just sort of in a, um, I'm interested to hear more what you make of that and then whether anyone else on the panel has comments about sort of the, the question of whether well, we don't already have a fundamental right to education under the Equal Protection Clause, the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution. Well, the Supreme Court has said there is no federal constitutional right to education, only a right to so-called equal opportunity to education if a state chooses to provide it. So what we are talking about is trying to clarify the federal role in education in some way. I am not proposing here and now specific language for such an amendment. I am suggesting that the time is nigh for all of us to think about the critical importance that education plays in the life of the nation in every aspect of organized society that we can imagine. And if you think about that and look at how we fund education, order education, and the tremendous failures of the 15,000 systems of public education we have, I think something very serious is awry. Legislative responses may take us half the way. Title I notwithstanding, there is much room for improvement. And so picking up on what was said at the last plenary session, uh, to some extent this is about a fundamental value that I think in the popular constitution most people feel they already have. This would be an effort to try to, in effect, codify a federal role in relation to something that every state already provides, so it isn't an alien idea. And it's something contrary to what my colleague has been saying that benefits everyone. 
Uh, I don't believe there is such a thing as national security or defense if you don't have well-educated people, among other things, just to operate the machinery of war. Alan or Michael, any? Sure, I'll say two things. I mean, I certainly agree that if we don't have quality education, the terrorists win, right? So that should be maybe our strongest, <laughs> in the current environment, our strongest argument. Um, you know, I, I would say that with or without a constitutional amendment, uh, we need a, a much more uh, meaningful and substantive conversation with the American people or amongst the American people about what uh, education means for our country and what a right to education would mean. I, you know, I mentioned these focus groups that we commissioned, and uh, one of the exercises that participants did was to sit, raise their hand if they believed something was a, a human right, a constitutional right, or both. And I can tell you that if, if our Constitution actually included all of the rights that, uh, you know, uh, Americans think it does, it would be the South African Constitution. Uh, so, you know, and yet uh, people feel profoundly betrayed. So you, you think about the notion, if you believe that there's a right to health care, a right to education, a right to affordable housing in the Constitution, and yet you look around and you believe that you're, you're, the, the nation's schools are failing, that 47 million people don't have health insurance, uh, that uh, you know, there's no county in the United States in which someone working a full-time uh, minimum wage job can actually afford to pay the, the, uh, the average rent in that place for a one-bedroom apartment, then what is your view going to be of government and of the Constitution and what that means? Uh, and so I think, you know, both as a mechanistically in terms of how does one, uh, you know, how, do, how does an idea become a constitutional amendment, but much more importantly, how do we achieve the kind of national will that we need? Uh, I think it's, it's really going to be crucial for us to have a different and, and more hopeful and more uh, specific conversation with the American people. And that is why if I mention the word constitution, people respond, pro or con but it opens up space for a different kind of conversation about, among other things, fundamental resource inequality. One small example. If 15% of the people in Arkansas have a college education, then that gives you a sense of how much money they're likely to be making. Arkansas, even if it taxes its citizens at a very high rate, will never catch up with Connecticut. We have tremendously variable economic systems and uh, hot spots and areas of depression across the country. The question is, is there a national interest in doing something that at least ensures people have some chance to have a livable wage and perhaps uh, rather than having a stagnant notion of economic development where it's a zero sum game and all I'm concerned about is my own education, we ought to be thinking about the social good that education represents and trying to make sure that everybody knows as much as possible. It could also save us tremendous monies on other kinds of problems like poor health care and imprisonment. And at the same time, it might actually give rise to a burst of economic growth, the like of which we've never seen. Twenty years ago, no one would have thought of the Internet. It's changed the entire economy of the world. So I think that this is an idea that will ultimately get its substance in the future, but it's not too early for us to start talking about it now because one thing is clear. It is intolerable to have race, class, and geography as the identifiable markers of education quality. I think that runs against the American creed. What? Did you want to add something? Michael? Yeah, no. It, look, uh, I just want to know what we're getting into. Look, it, it, nobody disagrees at the levels that we're now talking about, right? I'm in favor of quality education for everybody. Wonderful. I'm in favor <laughs> of health care for everybody. The question is, and the political, it's not true that the will isn't there. If 90% of the, if something in, in America polls at 90%, I assure you the politicians are paying attention. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Now, the one thing I've heard is we want more money. Yeah, okay, fine, at that level. So let's, I mean, that's a reasonable debate that, 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 that one can have, which I'd be perfectly willing to have, except I don't, I don't see why you have to go near a constitutional amendment to have that debate. If conversely you say, no, I really want to have this, this debate at the level of a constitutional amendment, 
and a constitutional commitment in some sense, whether it's a nudge or a right or whatever you want to call it. I want to know the details. Are we seriously proposing that the Supreme Court will in the future under an amendment like that play the role that state Supreme Courts play in these, um, <coughs> in these school equalization suits in, in the states? Are we seriously proposing that they hold the United States Congress in contempt? Are, they, are we seriously proposing that the Supreme Court sit around and say, you have to appropriate more money and here's how you have to run the system? I want to know the details. I want to know what I'm getting into. I don't want to buy a pig in a poke. I, that leads to what I wanted to follow up with uh, from some of your remarks, Michael. You had uh, objected to uh, the second Bill of Rights program as non-transparent. Uh, uh, for example, under the South African Constitution, the court orders uh, the political branches to come up with a satisfactory health care program in the treatment action campaign case, or uh, the Constitutional Court comes up with a mandate to come up with a workable housing program in the group boom case for squatters. There, these are two recent, you know, very uh, noted South African uh, Constitutional Court decisions which basically said there is a constitutional right to housing, there is a constitutional right to health. And what was one of the things that was most remarked, at least among scholars, about those decisions as a, as a positive is sort of the flip side of what Michael's critiquing, which is that they respected uh, the, in, the different institutional capacities of the courts versus the political branches by saying, you know, we know that what you've done does not provide uh, a, a program reasonably calculated to provide housing or a program reasonably calculated to provide HIV, HIV uh, treatment um, for mothers and, and infants. Uh, but we are only a court. We are not uh, a majoritarian elected uh, um, in institutionally varied branch like an executive or uh, legislature. So we're going to send it back to you, the experts on that, the politically accountable, to come up with the details. And I mean, generally, that is seen by a lot of commentators as a virtue. But Michael, I hear you saying it's, it's not a virtue. Now, isn't the transparency provided in the public engagement with the details of the program, isn't that where that part of the constitutional equation should be um, respond, dealt with, provided? Uh, several answers. Uh, the first answer is, uh, no, it's not transparent. Who are, it's suppose what the legislature then does on remand, or whatever you want to call it, turns into a mess. Whose fault was that? The court will say, we just told them to do something coherent. The fact that they then said, did something incoherent is hardly our fault. And the legislature will say, we wouldn't have done this in the first place had these bozos on the court not told us to do so. Now, who are you going to blame for this? The second thing, the second uh, reason is that if the, the constituencies that demanded this in the first place and went to court in the first place aren't satisfied with what the legislature did, they will go back to the court. And then the court will say, do it again, do it better. How many go-arounds do you want to have? The power to tell when the system has broken down is eventually the power to run the system. That is how districts, prison systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the United States, entire social service agencies ended up in the hands of federal district courts and special masters in the first place. Because they, for the best of reasons, they, they sometimes proved recalcitrant, sometimes it was to their advantage to lock themselves into those arrangements, into that kind of oversight. At the end of the day, there's no transparency left. I, I wanted to react to that if I could a bit, Michael. I think so. On, on the one hand, I think I, I agree, although uh, I haven't uh, finished Cass's book. I've, in fact, I haven't finished a book since 1999 when my first daughter was born. But, uh, but if, uh, you know, so I, I'm reacting more to your description, right, of, of Cass's book. But, um, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable with the notion of constitutional commitments, at least when it comes to jurisprudence, right? Although I think in terms of uh, kind of legislative commands, it's, uh, I, I'm more comfortable. But it, it's not clear to me in terms of your critique how it, it differs in this realm, how the circumstances differ in this realm from the things that you would acknowledge are appropriately rights, whether it's the right to contract or uh, to, to keep property, due process perhaps. I, I think 
you know, you probably agree that due process is, is a, le a legitimate right. And yet you have that same circumstance where, you know, uh, we, when we see it in the context of, uh, of the military tribunals, where government will try to produce a solution, they'll, it'll go, they'll get sued, they'll go back to the court, the court will have to consider whether they've met the right. The same would be true with, uh, you know, the uh, takings clause and, and the like. It seems for, for me, um, you know, we're, to return to the notion of a Bill of Rights, which I think is, is where we started, what, what does a Bill of Rights mean? Now, it, it, one can think of it as uh, constituency-based entitlements, but I think what rights mean is that they are the things that are fundamental to human dignity and freedom, in which there's consensus amongst, uh, be it the framers or, or other decision makers, uh, as to what those essential items are. Uh, and, and or number two, that they are the non-negotiable national priorities, the things that we know our nation must have to be the nation that it can be and should be to survive, uh, to uh, achieve uh, the, the, the blessings of, of liberty, uh, at the general welfare and, and the like, the things that the, the framers of our Constitution told us were, were important. And so uh, it, it seems to me that they're, they're not uh, kind of infinitely, they're, they're neither uh, inherently uh, uh, constituency based nor uh, are they inherently fuzzy uh, but I, I am interested in and, and perhaps there's a, a, a second level to your argument that I'm not catching but why are the economic rights different in this respect from the rights that you would acknowledge do exist or are legitimate that's for you Michael yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> I'm just following orders um, it, I totally agree, Alan, in, in this respect. I was on the verge of using the military commission's example myself. And I, I, for understandable reasons, I didn't want to stay with, uh, uh, get into it unnecessarily, but that's exactly what I'm afraid of, right? Um, there, on, on the first go around, look, Congress, the president can't do this on, this, on, on his own. Uh, let's, let's have Congress sort this out. Then they didn't, didn't sort it out correctly. Now again, it, what you're now looking at is the very real prospect that the detainee treatment will be sorted out by, you know, some assembly or collection of federal district judges. That is really a horrifying prospect, and everybody uh, understands that. Look, don't get me wrong, this is not a defense of the administration, which in this case, and in many, many other cases, has a lot to answer for. Um, it is just a way of saying, here you have arrived at a result that nobody wanted, and nobody can be happy with. Now, it's bad enough if that happens once, or in a few isolated contexts, or with respect to 350 detainees. The question is, do you want to run the entire education system, the health system, and everything else in the United States? Do you really want to run our entire government apparatus um, in, in that fashion? And my answer to that is, not if I can help it. This is the variation I on the theme that I hear all the time about how the cure would be worse than the problem. But I assure you that if it were your children or you, who was in one of these underfunded schools with teachers teaching out of field, with no access to technology, no hope for a livable wage, no job possibility for you in the future, consigned to a life of poverty and possibly imprisonment, you'd feel differently. This is one time where I think on the education issue, even with all of the frailties of the judiciary and the like, the role of the federal courts in education has been salutary. Otherwise, I would still be in the segregated schools where I started my education. I just want to uh, segue into, into Q&A by putting a question both to the panel but also to the audience, which I think is really at the heart of th this topic. Um, and it touches on Alan's point about justiciability. It touches on, on um, Lynn's point about how fundamental uh, certain interests in our society are, and it touches on Michael's point about transparency and accountability. Um, 
you know, when we talk about the Second Bill of Rights, we're talking about a, a slightly different vision of constitutional rights from the kind of classic, we go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court tells us and case is over formula. We're talking about a, a idea that's also, frankly, different from what the average layperson on the street thinks of as constitutional rights. They still, I think, have that, you know, go up to the court, court will, will solve it um, idea about constitutional rights. This is a, this is a, a tweak of that, a, a change of that. And then, so, so the question maybe for, for all of us is, what do, we, what do we gain by doing the effort that the plenary called for and that we're calling for, some of us at least uh, on this panel, of broadening our conception of rights to include more institutional actors, to include more public engagement, to include a more dynamic process between the legislature and the court. What do we gain from thinking about these things in terms of rights as opposed to just working for good political programs on all these basic issues of health care, of education, of housing? Bill Taylor. Here's a microphone behind you. Uh, my name is Bill Taylor, and I'm a lawyer who works a bit on education matters. Uh, I find myself very frustrated. I've gone through two conferences now, the D.C. Circuit Conference and this conference. Uh, I'm not sure we're getting at the, at the central issues. You started this discussion, Nina, by saying, uh, with a, an observation that No Child Left Behind was the wrong paradigm or an insufficient paradigm. Uh, you didn't explain that, and, and uh, uh, I'm not asking you to explain it now. Uh, but the fact is that this law that is in effect now started as the Improving America's School Act proposed by the Clinton administration. And the central finding of that act was that all children uh, could accept, uh, all children could learn and all perhaps the most, except the most cognitively <coughs> impaired could learn at, at very high levels. And if that was the case, the, the act went on to say that, that schools had an, ob an obligation to teach them so that the federal aid to education scheme should say, should uh, commit the school systems that receive the money to improving education for children. That was, that was the bill that was passed in 1994. Uh, in the No Child Left Behind Act, in some ways, it, uh, that's about 85% of the No Child Left Behind Act, but it adds that every child uh, that you, a school can't excuse its performance by, by doing a good job for uh, advantaged students. It has, to, it, has to do the, it has to provide progress for children of color, for limited English proficient students, for students with, uh, uh, with language uh, 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 needs, and for poor children. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that that established a set of rights or interests. The problem is and remains uh, that it is not at all clear that there is a right of, there's no explicit right of action in that law. If there were, I think we would be seeing more, pro we are seeing some progress, and I think we would be seeing more progress uh, than we are. Alan, I mean, we want to work on Sandoval, but we also want a, a right of action uh, in education as well, and the fact of the matter is that, that uh, it is not being provided and is not being provided because, largely because of the opposition of the teachers' unions, which object to the notion that schools ought to be held accountable, schools and school officials ought to be held accountable uh, for the progress of the, of the students. So we're, in some ways, we're, the conversation here is conflating rights and, and interests. And, and uh, I would argue that uh, that the rights of children should trump the interests of some other people in the system, and there ought to be a way that we can work this out. Uh, I, uh, I also look at the resource question and realize that with the, uh, with the uh, problems in the, in the uh, home mortgage market, and subprimes and the rest, we're going to see a, a decline in the property tax base, which forms the base for uh, funding education at a local level throughout the country, and we're likely to see a lot less revenue over the next uh, 
few years. Meanwhile, the demands on federal revenue to, uh, to deal with health care are, are big, big problems. It seems to me we have to, we have to uh, approach these problems on the ground and see where we can do, uh, make a real change. And that's, the, that's what I'm posing to you in a, uh, with some specifics. Uh, my friend Lynn is, is, is very persuasive about constitutional amendments. And, I'm trying to get something done sooner than we can get a constitutional amendment through. But she's very persuasive, so she may well, get me you. and a bunch of other people as well. <laughs> no, I agree with you that you do everything you can on the ground. I work on these issues every day. But what I'm proposing is a permanent reference in the Constitution to the federal obligation so that we decide where shall the federal resources go Education is not always trumped. I'm old enough to remember when we wanted to abolish even the Department of Education. Legislation comes and goes. It can be watered down, it can be beefed up, it can be underfunded. If there is no objective marker in the highest law of the land that is an embodiment of a value that we hold dear and that we understand is important for everyone and for the national security of this nation, we will never get anywhere. And as to No Child Left Behind, one of the sad byproducts of that legislation is that because of the emphasis on tests and annual yearly progress, I think we've created perverse incentives for some schools to simply push out and remove kids, not do anything about the dropout rate, because if the children are not there, we don't have to worry about uh, meeting our annual yearly progress. So each one of these matters is a matter of great complexity. I agree with you, but I don't think this idea is in any way uh, contrary to the notion of doing everything we can now. I saw several hands up over, over there. Uh -huh. Okay, sir, I'll get you after. I like that we're... Just hold it up closer to your mouth. Okay. I like that we started this conversation talking about something that happened in the Roosevelt administration because the events of the Roosevelt administration are somewhat unique in American history and that the economic collapse that occurred immediately before the Roosevelt administration meant that the interest of the country suddenly aligned with the interest of the poor. There was such widespread poverty that even the people who had previously been the wealthiest no longer had any consumers to sell their products to and so their interest collapsed. And what that meant is that laws that at no point in American history could have been passed before were enacted because it wasn't just that people in the abstract believed that, yeah, it's a good idea to provide social security or it's a good idea to have a minimum wage. It's because they were personally hurting in the absence of such laws. And the reason I make that point is because several people have cited focus groups and they've cited polls which show that there is support in the abstract for things like universal health care and universal access to an adequate education. And I agree with that. But I also know that at the end of this conference, I'm going to go home to a safe neighborhood and that my tax dollars will be used to pay a significant amount of money to a very well-trained police force, which will make sure that the people who are not being provided for do not come to my neighborhood. The point, the point that I want to make, I suppose, is that what we have in our society right, right now is a silent caste which does not have access to democratic rem remedies for their problems. And I recognize the problem that Michael presented, which is that when you have a court intervene, you take away the legitimacy of the democratic process. But it cannot be the solution to sacrifice a silent caste on this altar of democracy. And I suppose my question is, how do we strike this appropriate balance so that we do not have to wait for an economic collapse before more laws can be enacted which benefit those who are not represented? Well, I can start. I mean, I, I agree with you in part and disagree in part. I, I guess I think that uh, the interests of the country have always been tied to the interests of the poor. Uh, but what was different, one of the things that was different about the Roosevelt era, which, remember, was almost 16 years long, right, was that uh, that was manifest. Uh, 
it, it was undeniable to people. And, and yet, you notice that some, of, some New Deal provisions were truly universal, like Social Security, uh, and others were focused on uh, the poor. Uh, and the ones that have been most vulnerable over time have been those that were focused on the poor. Uh, you know, I would say that we are also in a unique moment, not uh, of the economic magnitude of the Great Depression, but the level of inequality in the country has meant that whereas uh, low-income folks uh, have typically thought, them, thought of themselves as the future rich in America. You know, I may not be uh, rich currently, I'm, you know, people who, who are quite low income think of themselves as middle class but about to be rich in, in one part of their brain. And that's starting to erode in the public consciousness. And that's not, I, I don't view that as a good thing, but it, it's in some ways uh, a more uh, kind of reality-based notion of, of mobility in our country. And I think that the potential is there for a significant political uh, and policy shift because of that realization. Uh, and it's due in part to the actual rise of inequality, but it's, in, it's due in part to the way in which that's manifesting itself in people's lives. And, I, I, and this is not purely from kind of focus groups and polling. It's from actually being out in the world and talking to people around the country and getting a sense of, of where the, the political uh, pulse is currently. And I, I think this is actually a remarkable period that we're in. I don't know how long it's going to last, and I think it's, it's incumbent upon us uh, to really be innovative and, and uh, actually to, to you know, serve those, those values and concerns in a way that moves the country forward. Can I want to call on the gentleman who's been patiently waiting in the, in the front here. Go ahead with, with the, with the uh, microphone. Yeah, so I think, make sure I think, we get uh, you in there. Um, one of the things that has struck me, uh, speaking to uh, Lynn, <clears throat> uh, both in a plenary session and then later at a break breakout, the point was made that any attempt to change the Electoral College is simply wasting our time because it takes a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress to propose such an amendment and would take three-quarters of the state legislatures to vote in favor of both houses in a bicameral legislatures and some of the states provide in their state election laws that it takes super majorities in their both houses of their legislatures to ratify federal constitutional amendments that's one of the reasons why the equal rights amendment came a cropper was because Although getting majority votes, uh, actually a supermajority in the lower house in Illinois, because of Republican filibuster, there was no way of getting the three-fifths majority required in the Illinois Senate. And so I think that there just simply isn't any way uh, in the foreseeable future to get a federal education amendment. Now, I think we have to think outside the box on some of these things. That was the proposal of the, the popular vote uh, coalition idea, state compact idea, uh, <clears throat> so that you reform the Electoral College, but not but directly by a constitutional amendment. I think one and, I, and I think we have to we have to think of these things. I know, for instance, under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it says that disabled children, it's a broad, broad interpretation of what is disabled, that it, are entitled to a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. That's now a statutory right, granted, but it does move the ball forward. And I think the Elementary and Secondary Education Act could be amended to insert a cause of action and a right to a free, appropriate, quality public education administered on an equitable uh, and fair basis. And uh, so I'm just sort of asking both Michael and I guess you, Lynn, uh, uh, what you think of this kind of an approach. I'll let Michael go first since he 
didn't get a chance to answer the last but, time. But, no, that, no, that's okay. If I may, I'll, I'll say something briefly in response, but I, I want to respond to this first, uh, because that was also, it, the, the, as I understand it, that's along the same line uh, that, that Bill Taylor suggested. I'm skeptical, and here is why. Uh, what's the one almost unambiguous uh, social policy success that the United States has had over the past 15 years, answer the 1995 welfare reform. People can disagree about the extent to which that was successful, the extent to which prosperity had something to do with it, or the welfare reforms themselves, but it's an, been an unambiguous success. What was the core of that reform? Answer, there is no individual entitlement under this statute for anybody. And the reason why that had to be written into the act in big bold letters is that the welfare rights advocates would otherwise have litigated the entire statute into the ground. Um, it's precisely that lack of an in individual entitlement that gave state governments uh, the, the flexibility and the means to, to uh, reconfigure their, um, uh, their welfare um, systems so far as we know, so far as I understand it, uh, to considerable effect as these things go. I want to say one, one quick thing in, in response to you. Like, um, my, my answer, and this is totally non part my advice to you guys is be of good cheer. Um, look, American politics moves in cycles, right? There are, because the system is so fragmented, uh, intentionally. There are long, long periods where nothing happens, where it's just a game of inches. And I don't care whether you get the courts into it or not, it'll always be a game of inches because nothing moves, right? Courts cannot remove the fundamental reasons why it is uh, a game of inches. Every once in a while, or every few decades, there are these periods of feverish activity, and there are lots of explanations why that might be so. The New Deal was one of them. The Great Society in the early 60s, that was another period, right? And in those situations, all the institutional veto points become opportunity points. And we may be nearing another phase like that. For example, it's, it's the first time in my recollection, which isn't that long, but at least, you know, three decades, where all three of the major presidential contenders now, too, um, we're basically economic populists, right? The pharmaceutical companies, those are the bad guys. And that's the Republican <laughs> candidate for, for the presidency, please. What that means for activist groups, and I'm just saying that for somebody who works the other side of the street on the same things, the way we think on, on the conservative side and libertarian side on these things, it, it, you know, you expect too much of American politics if, if you think, you know, the time always has to be right for something big. You have to get used to the fact for decades nothing happens, right? But what you can do in those, during those times is put ideas on the shelf. And when the time comes and all the veto points become opportunity points, that's when you want to be ready and say, here, that's, this is the idea. And you can do all sorts of things in the meantime. I mean, build consensus, try to figure out what really works, learn from other countries, learn from states, because in these interim periods, American politics, for all its weaknesses, for all of its inertia, offers lots of room for experimentation, private, you know, and, and local, and in all sorts of other ways. So there are things to do in the meantime, but one has to get away, I think, from the idea that, no, we have this idea, the time is now. I wanted to uh, say just a few words about the, the present moment. I happen to think that the very structure of the global economy is shifting in very dramatic ways. And those of us who wish to live or can live have the privilege of living in safe and clean communities because we have education and have a decent standard of living need to wake up before it is too late. We are interconnected with our brothers and sisters all around this country and around the world. And in particular, with the growth in wealth and income inequality in this country, you know, it's 40 years since we had the great urban riots, but this country is not exempt from having even civil disorder in its own midst. 
We need to be thinking hard now about what we can do to ensure that everybody, diverse as we are, believes in the fundamental fairness of our system of governance and has some sense of being a stakeholder and a capacity to have a decent quality of life and not be deprived of the means. And so I look to people like us who have these opportunities and advantages to understand the problems that are coming. <coughs> when I studied Brazil, South Africa, and the United States, numerosity of poor people does not mean that you're going to have an equal society. We can have a society with 20% of the people and masses of masses of poor people, but the American dream will have been betrayed, and I'm appealing to our better nature and our belief in fairness when I try to make this case for some significant federal commitment to help all Americans have a decent education. As to the gentleman's point, uh, sir, you and I are very much on the same page. I will support anything at this point that I think has a reasonable prospect of improving the quality of education for our children. This is a crisis. For those of you who have not looked, for example, at the film Corridor of Shame, you owe it to yourself to see it, to see what conditions we're asking children to go to school and have a love of learning in. I assure you that when you go to a school which says you are inferior, we devalue you. We don't think you are important. You come away not as the kind of American citizen we'd like to see, not a person who has some reasonable prospect for a good future, but the very kind of person that too many of us fear. So this is in everybody's interest, economically, socially, politically, and I want it in the Constitution because when the next president decides to start on one of these big war misadventures, I want people to be able to stand up and say, wait a minute, if you spend trillions of dollars a week in that country, how are you going to make sure that public education is not adversely affected? I want to have that kind of trade-off. Without it, we will always see the children shortchanged to everyone's collective detriment in the future. Thank you. I just want to, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, I want to urge everyone to join us at 7 o'clock for the dinner banquet, which is honoring Judge Patricia Wald. And I want to thank my speakers, Michael, Lynn, and Alan, and all of you for attending today. Thank you, thank you so much.